board meeting to order. We'll stand and be led in the pledge by Mr. Lewis. Thank you. Thank you. several guests who will be presenting awards or making presentations. Because of their support, our district is able to provide excellent academic programs and services to our students within safe and secure environments. We value our association with the guests and I'm pleased that they have joined us for this occasion. Our first presentation is a grant from the Toshiba America Foundation. Mr. Lewis Irizarry, Forensic Science Teacher at NFA North Campus. I'd like to invite Mr. Al Romano, our District Director of Science, to uh, do the introductions of our guests and tell us a little about this important grant and its significance for our students. Good evening, everyone, and, and thank you for giving us this opportunity. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about uh, a research project and a grant that was awarded to Mr. Louis Arozari, who's a North Campus NFA forensics teacher, who embarked upon a grant last year with the Toshiba Foundation um, and won this grant. And the grant is uh, um, the study of the effects of processing techniques on forensic DNA and analysis of skeletal remains. Um, in this grant, uh, he has, right at this point, six students working with him. Um, the students are, are processing uh, forensic material on um, DNA from skeletal remains, and this is a, this is a technique that's employed by scientists in natural procedures and in biology, and it's highly variable it's with the scan electron microscope. The study will uh, allow us to assess processing procedures used by forensic scientists, forensic laboratories, and natural procedures in biology, and it can affect, can affect the amounts of DNA extracted from skeletal remains as a subsequent DNA analysis. This, this grant also allowed us to, pro to purchase a photophoresis one DNA analysis system, which is a very expensive system that's going to allow these students and students in the future to use this procedure. Um, a little background on Mr. Rosari. Uh, Mr. Rosari is, of course, the forensic science teacher at our NFA North Campus. He is also a chief investigator for the U.S. Department of Defense for 16 years. In his role with the Department of Defense included extensive investigations and forensic analysis of evidence on a worldwide basis on all U.S. naval installations. Mr. Arizar was awarded the Department of Defense a Distinguished Service Medal for service above and beyond the call of duty while assigned as a senior investigator in duties in South China Seas as part of the Naval Intelligence and Naval Criminal Investigative Service, service Task Team. Subsequent to his retirement from the Department of Defense, he founded his own private investigation firm which he runs in partnership with his son, also an investigator for the past 15 years. Mr. Arizar also developed the college level forensics curriculum for the New York City Board of Education in 1998 and established a partnership with John Jay College so as to have the college award college credits for the forensic course for incoming freshmen majoring in forensic science. So he does have a, an extensive background, obviously, on forensic science. Um, I'd like to bring to the podium now three members Mr. Irizar himself. The president of the Toshiba America Foundation, John Anderson. And the director of human resources for Toshiba, David Richards. Anderson, and uh, it's a privilege to be here 
Uh, I knew Lou was a wonderful science teacher, but I didn't realize how lucky you are to have him not only as a, as a teacher, but as somebody who loves the students and who goes out of his way to innovate and to make something special for them. At the Toshiba America Foundation, our objective is to find and support those special teachers who want to do something a little bit better, a little bit different, who want to innovate, and that in the course of a year, if we are lucky, we find 100 or 125 teachers throughout the country uh, who qualify for our grants. So it's certainly a delight and a privilege to be able to participate in this recognition of Mr. Arizari. I'd also like to take a minute uh, to congratulate and, uh, and express my appreciation for this board. Uh, in the course of our work at the Toshiba America Foundation, we deal with a lot of school boards. And we've come to understand, and I was a teacher myself for a while, and, and understand that the role and responsibility of a school board and one of its primary objectives is to uh, maintain and, uh, and utilize the assets of the district and, uh, and uh, very frequently the school board is so focused on those assets <coughs> that they have to account for when you sign the checks that they forget what I think are the, the most valuable assets that any school or any district can have, and that is its teachers. And Mr. Irzari is one of those teachers, and for this board to recognize that, to take this time to honor him and to recognize what he has done, uh, reflects very well on you as members of this board, on your district, and once again, on Lou. So the, uh, the business at hand is to make this award and get him the check. <laughs> so let's do it. <laughs> was to Mr. Arizari's hard work, how much that grant was for the district and the students of our district, and that was $10,000. by Energy Education for its efforts in the area of energy conservation and management. During the past couple of years, the district and school communities have been very diligent in promoting efforts to make judicious use of our energy. Mr. Roger Ramjug has led this initiative, and I'd like to invite him to, to join the group at the podium and introduce our next guest, 
and tell us a little bit about the award. Roger? Photo finish, huh? Go on, Jim. I'm going to introduce Mr. Jim Galletley from Energy Education. He's going to present the award to us. It's our second award in, uh, um, from the Environmental Protection Agency with respect to the uh, level of reduction in the consumption of energy as it transcends to our environmental results. And as you'll see, I have a, a brief presentation to accompany it that will show how we got to where we are. So I'm turn it over to Jim. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, 
and that's a big number, and I, I don't even know what a metric ton of CO2 looks like, but um, it's the equivalent of taking six, over 626 cars off the road for a year, or planting almost 90,000 trees and letting those trees grow for 10 years. The amount of carbon dioxide they would process or absorb over that period of 10 years. So that's a significant impact um, on the environment. Um, so it's my pleasure on behalf of uh, William Spears, our owner and founder, um, to present the Newburgh and Orange City School District with our Energy Excellence Award. Um, and I'd like to, to present it to uh, the superintendent and board president. school district, not just the people standing here. So every teacher, every custodian, every administrator, everybody in this district has chipped in to do this amazing job over the last two years. And for those in the sound of my voice, I thank you very much for it. changing behavior and, and a uh, change of the culture to recognize the kind of statement we're talking about. Um, uh, school district energy consumption is managed in three separate ways. Infrastructure improvements, many of you that are homeowners will identify with this as far as building envelope and the systems that are installed, um, and even down to the appliances that we use, uh, the degree of efficiency that contributes to that. The second part of it is uh, up to 35 percent is managed through energy generation, which at this time we haven't, as a district, haven't crested into that, but it's the desire of ours. Um, and along with that comes the cost that we pay for our energy. Our business official and his team have done a remarkable job as far as reducing that cost as far as we can go with respect to consortium buying and other venues that are continually remain vigilant. But here's the part where our program, the rubber meets the road in our program. We can manage up to 35% of our energy here, and even in your home, um, using people-based behavior changes and cultural changes. As simple as uh, setting back temperatures during unoccupied and occupied times. Uh, we have adopted a district policy that, re that calls for 68 degree heating temperature set points, 72 for cooling, um, and when those areas are unoccupied, it's expected that they be set back. Uh, we visually raise awareness of the importance of managing energy. One of our biggest obstacles is absent-mindedness. Just folks are so busy in their schedules, they maybe either forget to turn things off or, uh, um, you know, and anything that stays on, stays on overnight and costs energy needlessly. It's very subtle, the cost of energy, but it's very expensive. We do uh, frequent building energy audits. We have the capabilities to monitor our energy consumption both online as well as in person. We analyze utility bills, and I say so because, and I recommend that for you as, as consumers as well, because the Central Hudson is not flawless. Uh, but our biggest key is we, we continually educate our faculty, staff, and students on proper procedures for when we have long periods of, of vacancy, that we shut things down for weekends and long, and, and long breaks. 
And uh, over the last two years, it's added up to a 21% reduction. Our district profile, as far as energy consumption, 17% comes from lighting, 43% comes from heating, ventilation, and air conditioning and refrigeration, and 40% comes from everything that's plugged into the wall, including technology. They're big consumers. Um, in 2009, our utility costs were cresting $3 million. Um, over the, the next two years, you can see we have three columns here, our base year, our first year success, our second year, and we're now into the beginning of our third year. And you can see we don't measure dollars. We calculate dollars, but we measure actual consumption in the form of kilowatt hours, cubic feet of natural gas, as Mr. Galletley said, and heating oil and gallons. And throughout all three uh, areas in the last three years, we have reduced, with the exception of uh, we've had a modest increase in our one facility uh, that we do burn oil in. So this, and that's, that's due to some infra infrastructure adjustments. So this, there's a fluctuation, but overall we've done remarkably well. Um, in measuring our behavior base against our infrastructure improvements, because as many of you know, we're now into our eighth year, Andy, right, of capital project improvement, yes. right? And that has contributed enormous energy efficiency to the type of equipment. And that's recognized as part of the gains, not calculated by any means as part of that 21%, um, but it's taken into consideration. But at the same time, the reason why we, the district delved into the capital project is to bring our facilities up to standards. And for the amount of uh, bond money that was received, it's gone a long way and, and stretched pretty far. And we've done a remarkable job of adding cooling systems throughout the district to, to uh, facilitate better and more comfortable education environments. And I've got a breakout here as far as the um, the schools and the different activities that have contributed either for or against our energy efficiency. As you can see, with all of the additional cooling as compared to the efficiencies we've gained, um, our 21% of measures, measurements so far is a bona fide fundamental number. Because over the last two years, these are the kind of increases, our energy load has actually increased. So if anything, if you were to calculate these numbers in, it would be even higher. Moving forward, we, are, we have a long way to go as far as our, our district energy plans are concerned. Our, our infrastructure continues to go through capital improvements, and uh, when that leaves off, we have much more potential there to increase our energy efficiency as far as infrastructure is concerned. One area of that is our heating, ventilation, and air conditioning control system. Um, that's one area. It's another tool in the toolbox that we can use to schedule and uh, uh, schedule occupied and unoccupied times of uh, systems being on. Changes in the way energy is generated. We do have hopes for introducing uh, solar applications for the district, not just for the sake of energy savings, that's a benefit of it, but also for the educational value it brings to our students. Uh, our energy costs continue to escalate in spite of economic conditions. The energy industry is the only industry that's recognized inflation in the last three or four years of our economic downturn. At the same time, it's the only industry that's added new jobs. Um, the cheapest unit of energy, folks, is the one that's never used, and that's what we focus on, is trying to conserve as much as possible. Raising awareness and getting folks culturally introduced to uh, saving money. Uh, we, are, we have partnered with Energy Star, and this is our second award towards recognizing uh, the highest level of efficiency, which will probably take us about another two to three years to achieve, but we have qualified for our partnership with the federal government, that's uh, the uh, U.S. Department of Energy in its partnership with the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, and we will, if we continue on the path that we're going, we'll, we'll certainly recognize, uh, recognize those achievements. In recognition again, everyone is an energy user. From the top, down, and back up again, we engage everyone in, uh, we educate and engage everyone in being conscious of um, the energy that they use, and each person is the best energy manager um, that you can find. It, 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 if, I, if I'm using, if you're using, if we're using appliances and things individually, we're the only ones that know when we're finished with it, and we can turn it off and shut it down and make sure that uh, we're not wasting money. Um, I just I want to take this moment to recognize one of our biggest uh, 
uh, one of our biggest advocates is uh, Mr. Andy Calvano, who's not here this evening, but I, I, I want to I give some recognition to him and his staff in the Food Service Department. This team pulled together uh, over the summer in recognition of energy conservation, and they consolidated all of the leftover food and provisions that the district had. Uh, in our first year, we were able to shut down over 21 freezer units, which it would have stayed on for the entire month of July and August. Folks, I'm talking money in the area of 35K, you know, $35,000 less that was spent because these things run continuously. That's just one example. Last year, we had um, an energy contest between Temple Hill and Meadow Hill. And again, the Food Service Department came across with remarkable uh, uh, barbecue as well as uh, uh, ice cream for the kids as far as incentive to keep it moving forward to keep that awareness raised. So across the board, our faculty, our principals, teachers, principals, operations and maintenance, our HVAC team, Mr. Velez and his staff, uh, Mr. Jensen and his staff, administrators across the district. I haven't encountered anyone that's not engaged, and I thank you for that along with the superintendent. So with no further ado, let's keep Last one, I'll turn off the lights. <laughs> As we're getting set up, our next presentation is about the Dignity for All Students Act, also known as DASA, D-A-S-A, -S which was enacted by the State of New York in 2010. The law was signed in 2010, school districts had until July 1st, 2011, compared to the implementation beginning on July 1st, 2011. I would like to invite Dr. Noriega to the podium to introduce our next guest. Excuse me, sir. Thank you. 
who are also in this room, have attended conferences and workshops to become familiar with the act. At these conferences and workshops, one presenter in particular has always been able to leave participants enriched with his wealth of information and the historical perspective that he provides about the journey to bring the Dignity Act to reality. When he was asked if he would come to one of the board meetings in Newburgh to share his thoughts about what has, about what has taken place and the road still ahead, he rearranged his schedule and we truly appreciate that Rob Condon, who is the co-chair of the Lesson the Gay, Lesbian and Straight Education Network, Hudson Valley Chapter, is with us this evening to present an overview of the Dignity Act. Thank you, Rob. just starting to talk about where we're going from here um, right about now, when it's about six months or seven months out from implementing it. Um, I was fortunate enough to have some uh, Newburgh faculty and administration at some of the conferences we've been doing around this, and they all think I'm really wonderful about talking about it, so hopefully I am, all right? So I'm gonna give you a little bit of perspective. Um, the Dignity All Students Act was, uh, is a comprehensive anti-bullying and harassment law enacted in 2010. It takes effect in July 1st, 2012. Most school districts, as I said, are just learning about this now, even though we're a year into the enactment. Um, and it applies to all public schools, charter schools, and BOCES programs. Dignity is an enumerated law providing protection for bullying and perceived harassment based on a person's actual or perceived race, color, weight, national origin, ethnic group, religion, religious practice, disability, sexual orientation, or gender identity expression, which is not on the model of the screen here. Um, what's important about dignity is that it actually has these terms in the law. Um, many anti-bullying uh, legislation across the country has said statements like, thou shalt not bully. Right? Bullying is not good. We don't want our students to be bullied. New York has become one of only 10 states in the United States to actually say, you must protect your students around all of these categories and put it in the law. All right? the, what is very interesting about this is that it also provides us an opportunity to look at harassment and bullying beyond what we have traditionally thought as harassment and bullying. Okay? Harassment is defined as the creation of a hostile environment by conduct or by verbal threats, intimidation, or abuse that has or would have the effect of unreasonably and substantially interfering with the student's educational performance, opportunities, or benefits, or mental, emotional, or physical well-being. This definition of harassment is a very broad definition of harassment. It goes beyond our regular understanding of harassment as pushing or shoving or general name calling. The dignity of law requires school districts to look at educational performance, opportunities, benefits, mental, emotional, and physical well-being of all its students and protect all of its students and their opportunities around them. Dignity made New York only the 10th state in the United States to enumerate the policies, um, including sexual orientation or gender identity and expression. Um, these are listed in alphabetical order, but the very first state in the United States to pass an enumerated law that protected students based on sexual orientation and gender identity or expression is the state of Iowa. Many of us think that we're really progressive here in New York State, right? Uh, we, uh, we lead the charge and everything. 
Iowa was the first state to say, we will protect all of our students, including those um, with sexual orientation or gender identity <coughs> expression concerns. It took 10 years for New York State to pass the Dignity Act. Right? The very first time it was introduced into the, to the New York State Legislature was in the year 1999. It did not pass until 2010. And the main reasons were because it included sexual orientation and gender identity expression. For 10 years, our state said, our students who are gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender do not have the right to be protected. And fortunately, in 2010, everyone agreed they absolutely that 10-year process included a huge coalition of members who were fighting to have the legislation passed. There's an enormous list of them here, many of them who said over and over again, we must have enumerated policies because thou shalt not bully does not protect anyone, right? And we must include sexual orientation and gender identity and expression. At one point around the year 2009, there were a group of people who said, we will pass the law if you drop gender identity and expression. And this coalition said, absolutely not. We're going forward. And if this law does not include gender identity and expression, then we will not have the law. So the, all of these organizations are to be commended for, for standing up to them. So what does it do for us? It actually puts a lot of responsibility on the school districts and the school boards. So get ready, right? Um, the very first thing that, that it does is it requires school districts to update their anti-bullying and non-discrimination policies to include codes of conduct um, that prohibit the harassment and discrimination of all of those categories that are in the law. Uh, Newburgh is actually pretty good on that. She already has sexual orientation in your non-discrimination and anti-bullying policies. You do not have gender identity or expression. Um, and there are some other categories within that that you still need to work on in terms of race and religious practice and things of that nature. Um, but I believe that um, later in December you're going to have a representative from the New York State School Board Association who's going to present to you the model policy that's being um, distributed to all the states. Um, and those changes can be made and have been made in some of our districts in the Hudson Valley already. Another very important policy, part of this policy is that the codes of conduct must be explained to the students in ways that they can understand it, right? How many times do we have a big list that we give to the students, right? And we say, go read this, right? And then they go, well, I don't even know what that says, right? Dignity requires that we put all of these codes of conduct in age-appropriate versions <laughs> so that our students actually know what it means to be bullied or what they, have, what they can do if they are bullied. Another very important piece of this is that it requires all school districts to identify at least one member in each school building to be trained on how to work with students who have been bullied or who are bullied. Right? And they are to be trained around the concepts of human relations in the areas of race, color, weight, national origin, ethnic group, religion, religious practice, ability, sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression and sex, right? That's a lot, right? So school districts are required to train their staff and at least one person who can actually handle these issues. But my recommendation has been that all of the staff actually get trained on what, how to understand when this is happening and how to respond to um, students who are coming to us and saying, I'm being bullied for these reasons. District level training designed to raise employee awareness of discrimination and harassment and train employees on how to respond and prevent and respond to discrimination and harassment, right? I think it's very, very important that every school district think about what it means in their district to have discrimination happen, right? Harassment, the law actually defines for us what harassment is. It's creating an environment that a hostile environment that makes it difficult for a student to succeed, 
the discrimination as we know is often very subtle and it isn't often seen to, to those of us who are traveling to the world. So applying our concepts and our understanding around all of these categories in terms of discrimination is extremely important as well. <coughs> Modification of the civility curriculum. Dignity requires that each school district build these concepts into their civility or character education curriculum as it already exists in the school districts, right? So most of our school districts already have programs throughout um, the K through 12 classes that talk about character ed, that talk about being a good citizen, that talk about respect and understanding and, and being a good citizen in our school. Um, the, the challenge for most school districts will be in this area around having those discussions around all of these categories from kindergarten forward, right? Most of us have, have relegated the discussion, particularly about sexual orientation and gender identity, to the high school levels, right? We've said that's a high school topic. We're gonna to have a gay straight alliance in Newburgh Free Academy, but we're really not gonna talk about these topics in the middle schools and the elementary school. Dignity says we have to talk about these K through 12. Age appropriate, in appropriate ways, um, to give all of our students a fair chance at succeeding in the school district, right? In particular, the, the things that we see a lot in elementary school have to do with gender, right? A lot of times students will come home, I actually have a, a friend that I spent a weekend with last weekend who sent their student, their son off to kindergarten for the first time this year. The very first thing he said when he came home to her, day one, mommy, I can't play with you because you're a girl. He learned day one in kindergarten that girls play certain games and boys play certain games, and now he can no longer play with mom because the school said girls go over here and boys go over there. Right? So there's lots of different ways that we can talk about these topics in kindergarten, first, second, third grade, as well as in our high school um, classrooms. Reporting, bullying, and harassment. It requires each school district report material incidents of discrimination and harassment in New York State at at least annually. Right? And, and incidents involving discrimination and harassment um, based on the enumerated classes must be specifically reported. So that means that each school district needs to now say, this was an incident about, about bullying around religious practice. Right? Not just an incident of bullying, but around religious practice around appearance, around whatever the category may be, so that the State Ed Department understands the impact in your school district of this law and your response to it. So it gives us a lot of framework. It tells us that, that we need to do a lot of different things in our school district, and accomplishing that is going to be an ongoing task. Uh, the very first thing that is important for school districts to do is to understand the law, right? What I'm talking to you all about today is a very brief overview of it. There are policy changes that need to happen. There are education for our staff and our students that need to happen. Uh, it's very important that everyone in the district, from the faculty on down to the community and parents, understand all of these topics and what this law is. It's important that everyone in this room and in this community know what it means to be harassed or bullied in Newark school districts, right? Because what happens in this school district doesn't look like what happens in the Chester school district, right? Or in the Marlboro school district. This school district has its own flavor, it has its own personality, and understanding where those incidents are already happening, or the potential for them to happen in Newburgh is critical for you to be able to respond. Identifying tasks and responsible parties. This one is absolutely key. There's a whole list of things that the law requires that our school districts to do. Many school districts are going, ah, what do I do? Wait, where do I start? The best thing to do is to start and to identify people who will take charge of different categories. Obviously, the, 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 the school board is responsible for the policies, right? but training and civility curriculum 
and, and awareness building is can be the responsibility of the whole district, but assigning people to take on those tasks with them and identifying timelines that say, we're going to do an awareness training in the spring, and then we're going to do another one in the fall, and we're going to build a team around implementing this particular law is critical for success. Assess and reassess and reassess and reassess and reassess. It is the law now, which means it's not going away unless someone creates another law that changes it. Right? So we need to continue forward with the concept of creating a safe school environment for our um, students. Help colleagues to understand it better. Seek assistance and or training. Right? And communicate with students and families. I'm actually glad to be doing this presentation at a school board meeting because oftentimes families and students are the last to understand the process, right? Because everything happens in the school and your student goes in and you say to them, well, what's going on today? What did you learn today? And they come home and say, no, nothing, right? Or they don't even want to talk to you, right? So having the communication go back and forth between the students and families in the school district around this is critical. So I would encourage all of you to ask questions along the way. The law provides an opportunity for us to protect students' education, performance, opportunities, benefits, mental, emotional, and physical well-being. Right? The law was created to protect students. I say that the law's real intent is to provide an opportunity to enhance students' educational opportunities, to enhance their performance, to enhance their mental, emotional, and physical well-being. We can take the dignity law and we can check it off, and we can say, we did this, we did this, we did this, and we may never actually change the climate of our school districts unless we say the real intent of this law is to make our school districts better for students, not just protect them from the bad. There's a whole host of organizations right here in the Hudson Valley that can help do that. A number of these organizations have already been participating in person in Hudson Valley and the Hudson Valley LGBTQ Center um, over the last couple of years in, in a number of state school roundtables where we get together quarterly to discuss topics that are impacting students in, our, in the Hudson Valley area and we roll out programs to the school districts to try and help around these concepts. The next one coming up is No Name Calling Week. Um, and there's lots of programs and educational opportunities in all of these organizations right here. Many of them, and this is what everyone likes to hear, what do we go for free? Because of all, we know how much school boards uh, struggle with budgets, and we know how much the budget is impacted as we go forward with the economic challenges and we talk about energy already. Uh, many of the organizations here will provide assistance for free. Um, or at least provide you with a contact person that can help um, at, at a reduced cost. The challenge with dignity, of course, is that there is no funding to implement any of this, so uh, tapping into these particular organizations is critical. And that is the need. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Conlon. Very nice in-depth presentation. We appreciate you coming here tonight and sharing that with us. Any board members have any questions, Mr. Conlon? Thanks again.
Next on our agenda tonight, we have a report from our school attorney, Mr. David Shaw. Thank you, Mr. Pizzo. Um, this is a report regarding the boys' basketball team attendance investigation. During the past six months, the Board of Education called for two investigations regarding the attendance of the NFA varsity boys' basketball team that played during the 2008-9 and 2009-10 school years. First, the board engaged retired Ulster BOCI Superintendent Martin Ruckless to conduct a forensic audit of the team's attendance in light of allegations that many of the players had hundreds of cuts and that such conduct was enabled by school personnel. At the conclusion of Dr. Ruckless's audit, our law firm was called upon to supervise an investigation conducted through the district's Human Resources Department into the practices of school personnel involved with the implementation and oversight of the district's attendance policies, 5200, the general attendance policy, and 5441 that governs athletic participation. The questions we were asked to review were these. How could this happen? Was there malfeasance and or nonfeasance? Should there be accountability in the form of disciplinary proceedings? As stated during our interim report of June 28, 2011, the investigators interviewed 57 employees, including administrators, attendance staff, teachers, technology staff, clerical staff, coaches, and a student. The last aspect of the investigation was a review of the computer system through 10x technical staff to inform if there were, was any other evidence of which the district was unaware that implicated staff members in a manner for which disciplinary action should follow. That information did not produce further significant evidence and consequently, we are finalizing this investigation and making this report. The factors that contributed to the excessive class cutting and tardiness that informed this investigation were as follows. The lag time on reporting cuts and tardy events under the 10X computer system that was in use until February 2010. The students themselves were apparently well studied in the 90% attendance rule of policy 5200 and kept just below the violation level. They primarily did their cutting during marking periods outside of their season of play. There were hundreds of parentally excused cuts. There was a substantial number of administratively excused cuts and tardiness events, sometimes excused beyond the three-day limit of policy 5441. There was an undue reliance upon civil service support staff to monitor attendance. There was a failure to conform the coding system of the computer attendance programs to the coding system of attendance policy 5200. These matters are currently being addressed by the board and administration through their policy initiatives and at the building level. As the remaining issues involve follow-up regarding internal personnel matters, there will be no further public reports to the board about this investigation. Thank you, Mr. Shaw. That concludes the superintendent's report for this agenda, Madam President. Thank you, Mr. Pizzo. We have um, copies of public comment procedures as well as the board's bylaws on meetings, uh, policy number 0160 for the public provided on the back table in the corner as you exit the auditorium. At this time, we will have public discussion and comment on agenda items. I will first take uh, people's um, comments on agenda items based upon uh, people that turned in a request to speak. After that, it will be opened up to anyone in the public um, that would like to speak on agenda items. I have one request.
speak on agenda items, and that is from Mr. Chris Ekes. up a little bit uh, I'll take some blame for that and uh, again there is a time factor for this as a matter of fact uh, at the conclusion of this should the board approve this particular trip I would request that Mr. Pizzo sign some release and liability forms uh, I just wanted to Sorry. inform you on this trip that this is now our typical or annual trip that we take to Texas I'd like the board members to know this is no longer the trip where we race cross-country. Uh, just to make you aware of that, the speeds in the cross-country race in our solar cars have attained 75 miles an hour. I consider that way too dangerous for our kids to participate in. When we're on the racetrack down in Texas, they're over 85 miles an hour. Uh, very dangerous, I think. So we have found a, a new race to participate in, which we did last year. This is an energy efficiency race. It does not have to do with speed that we will be participating. It's on the roads of Houston. They're cut off and blocked off by uh, the uh, Shell Eco Marathon group. And we race at very tame speeds in terms of 17 to 18 miles an hour uh, on these roads. And of course, it has to do with energy conservation. So that's what the uh, trip is about. The final thing I'd like to say about this trip is thank you very much for your untiring support. Because, because of your untiring support to this trip, if it is approved, I am taking, I must be out of my mind, 38 kids, four teams, and four solar vehicles down there. So I thank you very much for your support. It's a great program. I believe it. I know you believe it. And certainly the public and the kids believe it. So thank you very much. Yes. Mr. Levenstein? Yes. Mr. Lewis? No. Mrs. McAfee? Yes. Mr. Kropach? Yes. Mr. Gresh? 
Yes. Mr. Bradley? Yes. Mr. Woodhall? Yes. Mr. Yes. Our next item on the agenda is from the superintendent. Thank you, Madam President. Resolution A is to approve facilities project change orders associated with approved projects. NFA renovation project, NFA auto body project, and HOH renovation project. South Middle School Renovation Project, Bales Gate Renovation Project, Set 1, Set 2, and Gardner Town Renovation Project, Meadow Hill and Temple Hill Renovation Project. Can I have a motion? Questions or comments? Roll call, please. I have a question. Sorry. Uh, uh, I understand that we talked about this the workshop um, that on some of these um, change orders that although we're, we're uh, doing a change order and we're putting the money in for a change order that, that we're going to get a back charge on certain things. If in the future we could put in writing that we are getting back charge, so if we go back, you know, we know which ones we're getting money we back from. Actually Absolutely. I can bring that to the attention of Mr. Damon, our project manager, and make sure that um, when he turns these in that he includes that in writing. Any other questions on this resolution? Roll call, please. Mr. Levinson? Yes. Yes. Mr. 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 Yes. Yes. Mr. Yes. 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 Thank you, Mr. Pizzo. Our next item on the agenda is from the Assistant Superintendent for Student Intervention and Support Services. Thank you, Madam President. Next is a resolution to approve facility use requests from Habitat for Humanity of Greater Newburgh, Life Changes Ministries, Inc., Newburgh Performing Arts Academy, and Quick Strike Football Club. I have a motion. Second. Questions or comments? Roll call, please. Mr. Levinstein? Yes. Mr. Levinstein? Yes. The next is a resolution to approve recommendations from the Committee on Special Education. I have a motion. Right. Questions or comments? Roll call, please. Mr. Levinstein? Yes. Mr. Yes. Mrs. McAfee? Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Yes. The next item is a resolution to authorize the superintendent of schools to execute a consultant agreement with Centris Group to provide technical assistance in stack processing and IEP direct usage. Funding source IDEA Part 2, Section 611. I have a motion. Questions or comments? Roll call, please. Yes. 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 Next is a resolution to authorize the superintendent of schools to execute a consultant agreement with the Centris Group to develop and implement a technical assistance plan toward improving outcomes for students with disabilities and their families. Funding source IDEA Part B, Section 611. Questions or comments? Roll call, please. Mr. Levinson? Yes. Mr. Levinson? Yes. Mr. 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 Yes.
Roll call, please. Mr. Levinstein? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Mrs. McAfee? Yes. Ms. Parkhouse? Yes. Mr. Rash? Yes. Mr. Vesley? Yes. Mr. Whitehall? Yes. Mr. Chen? Yes. Next is a resolution to authorize the superintendent of schools to execute an agreement with handwriting without tears to purchase classroom supplies. Funding source IDEA Part B, Section 611. President, that concludes my items. Thank you, Dr. Moriega. Our next item on the agenda is from the Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum and Instruction. Mr. Fortune is not here this evening, so Mrs. Lima will be reporting for Curriculum Instruction. Thank you, Madam President. The first item is a resolution to approve the new Science Tech Department textbook adoption for the 2011 2012 school year. It's the Earth Science Bilingual Textbook, grades 10 through 12. Funding sources, general funds, state aided textbooks. I have a motion. Mm -hmm. Questions or comments? Roll call, please. Mr. Levinstein? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Mrs. McAfee? Yes. Mrs. Parkhatch? Yes. Mrs. Rash? Yes. Mr. Vesley? Yes. Mr. Woodhull? Yes. Mr. Wichek? Yes. yes. Resolution B is a resolution to approve the participation of the NFA Electronic Keyboard Ensemble students to attend and perform at the Ohio Music Educators Association State Conference in Columbus, Ohio from February the 16th through the 17th, 2012. Funding source is the Fine and Performing Arts Budget. I have a motion. Questions or comments? Yes, Ms. Prokash. I'd like to see this table for further discussion for clarification purposes. I have a motion to item, title, uh, table agenda item B. So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Mr. Legacy? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Ms. McAfee? Yes. Ms. Prokash? Yes. Ms. Rash? Yes. Mr. Vesley? Yes. Mr. Woodhull? Yes. Mr. Chen? Yes. Next resolution is to approve the participation of the NFA Solar Car Team to compete in the 6th Annual Shell Echo Marathon in Houston, Texas from March the 22nd, excuse me, 27th to April the 2nd, 2012. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. Questions or comments? Roll call, please. Mr. Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Yes. Yes. Mr. Yes. Yes. Resolution D is to recognize the exchange program between the New Bergen Large City School District and a very large named city in Sicily, Italy. <laughs> 2011-2012 school year and to approve a trip to Sicily, Italy by NFA students during spring recess, April the 4th through the 13th, 2012. Funding source are parents and the Italian club. And I have a motion. So Second. Questions or comments? Roll call, please. Mr. Levinstein? Yes. Mr. Levinstein? Yes. Mrs. McAfee? Yes. Ms. Prokop? Yes. Mr. Rash? Yes. Mr. Vesley? Yes. Mr. Woodhall? Yes. Mr. Chuck? Yes. And resolution E is the resolution to approve conference requests. I have a motion. <coughs> Questions or comments? Roll call, please. Mr. Levinson? Yes. Mr. Levinson? Yes. Mrs. McAfee? Yes. Mr. Prokash? Yes. Mr. Rash? Yes. Mr. Vesley? Yes. Mr. Woodhall? Yes. Mr. Chuck? Yes. Thank you, Mrs. Weimer. Our next item on the agenda is from the Assistant Superintendent of Finance. Mr. Casella is not here this evening. Mr. Ed Lestowski will be reporting on his behalf. Thank you, Madam President. The first item on the finance agenda is a resolution to establish the health and welfare services rate to the 2011-2012 school year. Questions or comments? Roll call, please. Mr. Levinstein? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Mrs. 
The next item is a resolution to appropriate and make transfers from the tax tertiary reserve fund to the general fund for the payment of property tax refund claims during 2011 2012. I have a motion. Okay. Questions or comments? Roll call, please. Mr. Levenstein? Yes. Mr. Levenstein? Yes. Mr. McAfee? Yes. Mr. Procop? Yes. Mr. Rash? Yes. Mr. Beasley? Yes. Mr. Whitehall? Yes. Mr. Wichek? Yes. Thank you. The next item is a resolution to approve the following bids. Number one, bid number 12-05. 2011-2012 snow removal and sanding. Bid number 12-07, 2011-2012 various transportation needs. Can I have a motion? Questions or comments? Roll call please. Item D is a resolution to declare library books surplus and obsolete and to authorize disposition of the same. Can I have a motion? So Questions or comments? Roll call, please. Mr. Levinsky? Yes. Mr. Levinsky? Yes. Mr. McAfee? Yes. Ms. Prokosh? Yes. Ms. Rash? Yes. Mr. Bassley? Yes. Mr. Wendell? Yes. Mr. Wendell? Yes. Item E is a resolution to accept a donation of books from Active Learning Corporation. I have a motion. So moved. Questions or comments? Roll call, please. Mr. Levinsky? Yes. Mr. Levinsky? Yes. Mr. McAfee? Yes. Mr. Prokosh? Yes. Mr. Rash? Yes. Mr. Bassley? Yes. Mr. Wendell? Yes. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Item F is a resolution to accept a donation of a Hewlett Packard gas chromatograph from the Division of Natural Science at Mount St. Mary College. I have a motion. Second. Questions or comments? Roll call, please. Mr. Levinsky? Yes. Mr. Levinsky? Yes. Mr. McAfee? Yes. Mr. Prokosh? Yes. Mr. Bassley? Yes. Mr. Wendell? Yes. Mr. Chairman? Yes. And the final item is a resolution to accept bills and reports. Prevention Grant. 
questions or comments? Roll call, please. Mr. Levinstein? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Mrs. McAfee? Yes. Mr. Perkoff? Yes. Mr. Rash? Yes. Mr. Gensley? Yes. Mr. Dillon? Yes. Mr. Chen? Yes. Resolution M is a resolution to rescind the appointments as numbered in resolution 0927110 approved at the September 27, 2011 board meeting and further approve individuals for the winter coaching appointments as per Schedule J for the 2011-2012 school year. I have a motion. Second. Questions or comments? Yes, Ms. Prokash. Uh, I I have a motion to title Resolution M. Roll call, please. Mr. Levenstein? Yes. Mr. Levenstein? Yes. Mrs. McAfee? Yes. Ms. Prokash? Yes. Ms. Rash? Yes. Mr. Vansley? Yes. Mr. Whitmall? Yes. Ms. Kuchan? Yes. <coughs> resolution N is a resolution to rescind the appointments as numbered in Resolution 092711M, approved at the September 27, 2011 board meeting, and further approves individuals as for the Schedule J appointments for the 2011-2012 school year. Can I have a motion? No. Questions or comments? Roll call, please. Mr. Levinstein? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Mrs. McAfee? Yes. Mr. Perkoff? Yes. Ms. Rash? Yes. Mr. Gasly? Yes. Mr. Whitehall? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. Resolution O is to create a temporary math AIS teacher position at Heritage Middle School. The funding source is Title I. May I have a motion? Move. Second. Questions or comments? Roll call, please. Mr. Levinstein? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Mrs. McAfee? Yes. Ms. Prokash? Yes. Ms. Rash? Yes. Mr. Vesley? Yes. Mr. Whitehall? Yes. Ms. Richard? Yes. Resolution P is to abolish a point for part-time speech and language teacher position at Bishop Dunn Memorial School and create a point six part-time speech and language teacher position. Funding source is the fund balance. May I have a motion? No. Second. Questions or comments? Roll call, please. Mr. Levinstein? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Mrs. McAfee? Yes. Mrs. Kirkash? Yes. Mrs. Rash? Mr. Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Yes. Yes. Resolution Q is a resolution to appoint a district hearing officer. Funding source is the fund balance. I have a motion. Mm. Questions or comments? Roll call, please. Mr. Levinstein? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Mrs. McAfee? Yes. Mr. Burkash? Yes. Mr. Rash? Yes. Mr. Vansley? Yes. Mr. Whitehall? Yes. Mr. Chen? Yes. We're in resolution R is a resolution to approve teacher tenure recommendations. Mm -hmm. I have a motion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Questions or comments? Roll call, please. Mr. Levinstein? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Mr. McAfee? Yes. Mr. Prokash? Yes. Mr. Rash? Yes. Mr. Vesley? Yes. Mr. Whitehall? Yes. Mr. Yes. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mrs. Lamer. At this time, we will have public discussion and comment on non-agenda items. I will call in order that they were received. For the people that turned in a request to speak, and there will be 30 minutes allotted for public discussion and comment on non-agenda items, as is usual procedure around this. When you come to the podium, please give your name and address. First evening, first this evening we have Gilbert D. Sharp. <coughs> My name is Gilbert Sharp. I'm here on my own, and I want to ask the board to consider something I consider very important right now. Um, I hope you will consider renaming the athletic field at NFA after Danny Ray Butterfly. Um, 
Washington, thank you. I'm getting mad as John Perry. Uh, but please, uh, there has been no bigger supporter of NFA sports for the past 45 years than Danny. And I think this would be only appropriate to permanently change the name of that field and make sure that it remains that way forever. Because this is a person who loved Newburgh Free Academy sports. He did everything he could to support it and help it. And he's a great guy. I've known him all my life. I knew him all my life. And I hope that you will consider doing that. Thank you very much. Thank you. better and better 
And there are so many things that Mr. Ragusa wants to achieve, but we need, I believe, and other teachers believe, we need to keep what we have. And it is our prayer that you will be merciful, think on those things, and make a decision that will be beneficial not just to yourselves, nothing that is expedient to remove someone from one place and stick this person in, in our building, but let us survive, let us work in peace together. Give us that opportunity. And yes, I realize we're a Title I school. Yes, you're replacing, you're taking one African American out, replacing them with another African American, and on top of that, a woman too. But at what cost are you doing that? And Mr. Pizzo, I love you. I love you, Mr. Pizzo. So please, think on those things. Whatever is lovely, whatever is true, think on those things and have mercy. God bless you. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. Our, our next speaker is Desmond. Sorry, I can't read the last name. I have is from Sadie Tao. that's in the best interest. 
And that's what we are expecting you to do. Now, we want you to know that a lot of stones were unturned by this incident. And a lot of things were brought back to our memories. And it made it very clear that there are many situations that's going on in the school district that we have to be aware of and be more on top of it than we have been in the past. And that is, we were told that there's 47% of our children of color in the Newburgh and Large School District. And only 17% are African Americans in the administration department as teachers and administrators. We, we know that we can't let that be. Something has to be done about it. Now you have awakened the giant. So we're not gonna go away. We are very happy that the board made the decision and we support you that way. But we're going to want you to look among yourself and just make sure that Ms. Bond is not going to be still a jeopardize, that she is going to be able to come back into that school system and do the do great job that she did at NFA. That's what we're looking for you to make sure that this happens. And we want you to know that we are thankful and we are hopeful because this did encourage us that you, every one of you, have looked around and recognized that we all make mistakes and you have corrected some of your mistakes. But we say to you, let's don't let it stop there because we certainly do not want to hear next week that charges have been brought up against Ms. Bunn. We won't like that. And we don't want to just keep coming back and coming back. So thank you again. And as I say, let us not pit one against the other. Next I have Christine Hutchinson and Susan Martini. I'm Susan Martini, um, teacher at Heritage Middle School. Christine Hutchinson, teacher at NFA North. Um, seven years ago at Heritage Junior High, I started a, a group called Girls to Ladies. And I started meeting with a small number of girls to address some problems that were very clear in the classroom and in the hallways. We had a lot of social issues, so to speak. And this group has grown and kind of taken on a life of its own. I have a partner now, Susan Martini, which is why we're up here together. And we, we advise the group together. We have a core group each year of about 12 girls. And we meet and we talk about the issues that they're facing. And we, excuse me, we, um, we do character education, which is obviously a big push now, through peer mentoring, through community service, through adult to student mentoring. And basically the group is in jeopardy right now because of kind of the backlash from what's been happening with the basketball scandal, if you will. <coughs> right now, the target group of girls who would be in the girls group will not be allowed to participate due to the 90% and the passing rate rules that now apply to extracurricular activities. Those are, the children that fall into those risk categories are precisely the girls that we're looking to get hold of and, and help and turn around. And we've had, you know, a, a few successes over the years and you know, we've seen what an impact this group can have on, on these girls. And, we are afraid that these policies are taking the girls that need us most and that we most want to reach, but going to take us out of our reach. Right. 
So some, some of the girls who are in the group are here tonight and okay. they would like to say their piece. A couple of them have letters or notes that are written by parents that they would like to read. So as always, we'll move away and hand the reins to the girls. I've been in Girls to Ladies for now, going on four years. And I can say that it's helped me a lot. And what's reinstated now because of the Basketball Act, I probably wouldn't be able to be in Girls to Ladies either because I, w I do struggle in school. I fail a couple classes, but it's not intentionally. I, some people just aren't good at what they take. And um, we, don't want, we don't want this to impact any other people because we're trying to make Newburg turn around and shine for what it truly can be rather than what's in the newspapers and what's on TV because that, that shouldn't be us and it won't be us. We always do community service acts to try and get in the paper to show our other side we help the girls that need the help. Maybe even some boys too, if they would like to tag along. <laughs> but coming from someone who was a bad person, they truly made me into what I am today. And I'm really appreciative for Ms. Martini and Ms. Hutchinson. And I'm just, I'm wowed by the fact that I've come so far, and I don't want to see this club be in jeopardy because of one faulty act, and not all of them should be punished, like Ms. Jackson said, Ms. Robinson said, why, why punish all for just one? Punish that one, and let, the all, let everybody else shine through, because we can show you guys that we can turn Newberg around and it will shine through. Thank you. Thank you very much, young lady. Good girls. Um, Jasmine Amaro, um, like Terry was saying, it's so important for these girls to be in this group because everybody's always saying, Newberg, 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 Newberg. But it's not new break youth that's the problem. It's the lack of programs that we have to keep everybody off the street. Because if those kids that aren't on the ninety percent of this aren't in school, what are they doing? They're out there on the street. They're out there doing stuff that they shouldn't be doing. And if there's a program that they can come to, that they know they're going to get support from all the other girls, from teachers, then they're going to come and they're going to change. Like It's something that you look forward to going to. It's not like a punishment. It's not, I'm going here because my mom thinks I'm this and this and this. I'm going here because I know that I can trust these people. I'm here because I know that they can help me, right? And I know that I'm gonna that this is gonna do something for me. Club. My daughter has been a member of this club from 8th grade over the three years ago. She wanted to join so bad that she forged my hand on a permission slip. When I finally found out, after she attended a couple of meetings, I contacted the teachers involved in the club, told them that what she did and that she wouldn't be returning. She begged and pleaded, and I said no, until one of the teachers reached out to me and expressed that while, that while she, what she did was wrong, she felt that Terry could benefit from, from a club like this that would help mold her. I thought about it and give, gave in in the condition that she bring home a sign slip, slip every time she attended a meeting and upon returning to the club, she had to stand before the club and explain to everyone why she was absent. She did and I'm happy to report that never for that stunt again. Over the past three years, I've watched her become a very responsible, helpful, generous, caring young lady. 
I watched her coordinate with the teachers and members of Girls School Youth with Daphne Fines and Adams. Terry has taken the young members under her wing and shown them the ropes. She has also taken students outside the group under her wing and asked Kai of become their surrogate mother to keep them on the straight down, straight and narrow path. She's even gone as far as to break up a fight in the girls' locker room and it's past the time because there was no adult there at the time and she wants to avoid a bad situation and become worse. Yes, security and the gym teachers arrived quickly. She's attended multiple community outings with this club, has been very responsible in her position, representation of the club and helped to direct her other members as well as well, I'm sorry, as well right down to the clothes they wore. I'm not saying this because Terry is my daughter, but she has she is becoming a beautiful, responsible young lady, both inside and outside of school, not only because I demand it, but because of her involvement with this club. She participates in just about everything that's done. I say just about everything because she has an assignment or project due and there is a girls ladies event. She will choose her school assignment first. This is a responsibility that this club also teaches. While going to the meetings and events is great, you also have to do your work first at school and, not, and even at home. The girls also help each other academically as well as personally. If one of them has a problem, they can go to each other as well as confronting them Ms. Hutchinson for support, positive support. The club is a blessing, especially with all that's going on in the Newburgh School District and the world as a whole. Parents sometimes find themselves at a disadvantage while trying to prepare the family and hold down the job, multiple jobs or even trying to find a job. The attention that the kids get should be receiving falls through the cracks, and that's where the girls' leads comes in, to try and hold these girls together so that they can hold others together, and by doing that, try to uplift the community as a whole. These girls take the lesson they learn both academically and socially and apply them in every aspect of their lives and become ladies. Sincerely, Jacqueline Jordan Lee. kept open to the children that are struggling and need help as far as academic achievements and for any children that may be able to help the others. As for Rajane Lewis, it helped her in becoming an honor roll student and staying focused in school and adjusting her attitude. The program should continue to provide equal opportunities for the youth in Newburgh schools. Consider this line that has been drawn. I understand we have to have rules and we have to have organization, but the line shouldn't be drawn here. It, it has to be moved. Otherwise, we keep these girls from from developing like they should, and we keep them from excuse me participating in the community. They they are involved in community service of some sort at least once a month. They help with the Head Start um, Christmas party, the Easter egg hunt in Downing Park. They did a, a breakfast for the parents and the teachers during parent-teacher conferences. They, they built, excuse me, they planted beds at the armory for the community garden. Um, the Grange, they volunteered to serve dinner at the Grange for the Grange's fundraiser. These girls are all over the place and they're doing a lot of stuff. And we're con yeah, they have support from the Optimist Club, um, the Women's Bar Association of Orange County. These girls, they're out there and they're doing things that a lot of people wouldn't expect them to be doing and the group allows them to show everybody, including themselves, what they're capable of. Thank you very much. I especially want to thank all of you young ladies for having the courage to come and speak for something that's very important to all of you. So thank you young ladies very much. Very much. Would you like to say something? Excellent. Just one more thing. If you see, like, I came into this group not knowing anybody. And the 
the friendships that are made and the bonds that are made through these groups is simply amazing. And every, I, I look down the hallway of my school every day and all you see is people arguing. He said, she said, you're only seeing the bad side of one person. And I can honestly say I see bad sides of these girls every day. But then when they finally open up, when you get to know the real side of them, maybe they have issues going on. Maybe something's bothering them that's not letting them focus or letting them do their all. Like just that, that one thing that they can't get rid of. And having enemies now and all this fighting and violence, it doesn't make sense. But when you have clubs like Girls to Ladies and like the Girls and Boys Club even, and the Optimist Club, yeah. You, yeah. you start to know these people yeah. and you're like, wow, maybe they're not so bad after all. So instead of forming enemies, Newberg can start forming families and friends. Thank you. Thank you. You certainly have heard what you've had to say this evening. We will be discussing it and then it will be turned over to the district personnel who will be in contact with your teachers that are running and the advisors for the club. Thank you again, ladies, very much. I love you. Yes. <laughs> uh, next we will hear from Shantaya Christie. Oh, that's all the papers that we have this evening. Is there one anyone else here this evening that would like to comment on non-agenda items? Grace Bowles. On Tuesday, November 22nd, I attended a meeting set up by the Research Committee for the Executive Principal position at Newberry Free Academy. From the outset of the process, there was a conflict of interest. The interaction between the presider and the NFA staff was very inappropriate. He was not only in charge of this process, he was an NFA graduate and he was good friends with the uh, administrators that were there, past and present, and, he sh and it showed uh, a, a, an inappropriateness. I call that process tainted not only because of that, because the meeting was not well publicized. We had in attendance eight to 10 administrators, 20 to 25 teachers, three support staff, eight to 10 students, four parents, and 10 community members. Throughout the evening, the administrators were repeatedly pushing by name for Melissa Sigel to be selected as the executive principal because of the following reasons. Now, I want you to hear these reasons. We, the administrators, get along very well together. Someone from the outside wouldn't be familiar with the way the school runs. Someone from the outside coming in in the middle of the year would be a disruption. She's very visible. She's all over the building. Now let me tell you what we didn't hear. What we didn't hear was the acting executive principal during the last three months did not develop a strategic plan for students, began to put that plan into action, and was waiting to see what cor corrected action plan would be needed. What we didn't hear was the acting executive principal did not present research-based programs to staff members that will deal with students who are not able to read. We do have students at NFA who can't read. You do know that, right? Okay. What we didn't hear was the acting executive principal beginning at the beginning of the year 
checking the book inventory to see if there were enough books for all students and also become familiar with the policy relating to um, textbook. My granddaughter doesn't have any textbooks. Okay, and I never got an answer as to why. Okay, what we didn't hear was the acting executive principal after analyzing and desegregating data set with faculty members and use this data to guide them through preparing lessons for failing students or possibly hold a staff developed meeting with teachers doing the same. What we didn't hear was the acting executive principal looking at the data on suspension and analyzing why it is so one-sided against minorities and develop a plan to begin to deal with the corrective action plan from 1974. What they didn't say is that the acting principal was not out communicating with stakeholders, parents, churches, synagogues, mosques, business leaders, and so forth and so on. More importantly than anything I've mentioned above, if the acting principal doesn't know what is in the policy and procedures manual, then they haven't a clue as to what the district is all about. That is the educational bible for the district. What I have described to you is not an executive principle, but that is just a glorified name to get a larger salary. What I have described to you is an instructional leader. If you take nothing out of here tonight, take away the fact that NFA needs an instructional leader, not a bo another body that manages. You have put a timeline on the hiring of an instructional leader of December accepting applications, January review applications, and vote on it January 31st at your January 31st meeting. I hope that you understand you could not have picked a worse month to put this out. You have known since August that this position had to be filled. You wait three weeks before the Christmas vacation and you put a call out for applicants. I hope that you don't find, if you don't find an educational leader in eight weeks, I hope you put it out again and again until you truly find an instructional leader. This one has to be out of the box. The district is failing. Does it matter that we have to wait two or three more months to get an instructional leader in here? It doesn't matter. We've been failing for years. Have you put out a call for a selection committee? What's the criteria for being on that selection committee? Is this information going to go to the public about this selection committee? I believe since this is a position that calls for a person with a level of certain expertise, we use people like those at the Mount, those at Maris, those at New Paul's, because these professors will understand what is needed in an instructional leader. I recommend that you restart the process because many are watching to see this process that this process is open and fair and adheres to the policies and procedures of your board policy. The education of students hang in a balance, and more importantly, you should want to hire someone who will be able to see that all students receive a quality education, no matter where they come from or no matter how they behave. Right now, you have one person who is capable of doing this and he is on a fast track to burnout. You should restart this process. You do know this is a new position. It is not a principal position, but an executive principal position, which should be an instructional leader. I keep saying that word, instructional leader. There should be a different policy because this executive principal will have an expertise far and above that of a principal and the job, job description should look different than that of the principal. Again, for the sake of our children, you should want to hire someone who can guide the NFA staff to becoming a school not in need of instruction. Remember, only an instructional leader can do that. Thank you, Mrs. Bowles. We have time for one more comment.
comment, please step to the podium, give your name and address. Hi, my name is Art Flickta. I teach at NFA. I uh, Mr. Shaw said that uh, there would be no further public comment <coughs> to the board about the basketball player situation at NFA. It seems to me that the idea of lag times, parental excuses for absences, kids being aware of the 90% rule are all feeble excuses. Members of the NTA at the high school during the 2009-2010 school year when I was delegate there uh, were very involved in this issue because it affected our teachers. It had affected our students. We knew something was very wrong. We approached the principal, Mr. Copoletti, several times and he denied that there was a problem. He said, speak to the coach. We approached Mr. Townsend, the director of athletics, and he said that all the students met the requirements to play. We did this because we cared about education and we cared about our students. We wanted them to succeed. This was a terrible thing for the rest of the kids when they saw these other kids getting away with stuff. I believe that members of the board knew something about what was going on. I know Dr. Savinelli did. That is why she let the ball players go to uh, basketball camp instead of attending summer school, where they were supposed to. But even with evidence presented from Infinite Campus, uh, Mr. Copoletti and Townsend denied the problems. They denied that they existed. And it seems now that with Mr. Shaw's comment that the board is also minimizing the problem, not finding fault, and not finding the culpability that does exist. Thank you. Wow, excellent. hereby recesses into executive session for the following purpose, to discuss the employment history of particular individuals. The board may take further action after the executive session. May I have a motion? Resolution M is to rescind the appointments as numbered in Resolution 0927110, approved at the September 27, 2011 board meeting, and further approve individuals for the winter coaching appointments as per Schedule J for the 2011-2012 school year. Can I have a motion? So moved. Second. Questions or comments? Roll call, please. Mr. Levinstein? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Mrs. McAfee? Yes. Mrs. Perkoff? Yes. Mr. Bensley? Yes. Mr. Gwenhoff? Yes. Mr. Kuchak? Yes. I have a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Thank you. Mr. Pizzo, I have to say. <laughs>